I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then when my head was well within the room, I undid the ladder cautiously. Oh, so, so cautiously, cautiously for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night, just in memory. But I found the eye always closed, so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him. Calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he passed the night. So, you see it, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at 12, I looked in upon him when I slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or things. I fairly chuckled. And perhaps you heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now, you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with a thick darkness, for the shutters were closed fastened to the gear and wires. So I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in. I was about to open the ladder. My thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up the bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I had done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I, I knew that it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no! It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt, and I pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew, I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had not, his fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, "It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp." Yes, he has been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but. He found all in vain, all in vain because death is approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a very long time, very patiently without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open the a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray like the thread of a spider shot out from the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my